Hey, what's up everyone? Daniel here from Rarely Any Tech Videos. Okay, I admit it, I've been a little distracted lately with life stuff. As I mentioned in my post, I'm moving and building a house. I'm thinking this space has some potential for doing YouTube things. Let's just ignore that poll. Also, I've been competing for a significant promotion with my wife on the job that keeps the lights on. This was hard to predict, but I have found that to be an extremely overrated activity. Just keep that in mind if you're thinking of doing that for fun. Free advice. Anyway, all that being said, I'm happy to be back in the chair for the special occasion to review 2021's perhaps most highly anticipated soundbar system, the follow-up to Samsung's Q950T, the $1,200 to $1,700 but mostly retailing at $1,600, 11.1.4 channel Q950A. As the name suggests, there is a significant amount of overlap with the predecessor, the Q950T, the T, Mr. T. No self-respecting lady would adorn themselves with this kind of fabric. Scratchy. If you're trying to decide between the T and the A, maybe simply due to price differences, click up in this general region to see my Q950T videos. So as any one of you may or may not know that much about the Q950T, I'm gonna stick with my normal review style on this bar, not just giving updates, but I will point out notable changes and upgrades. I'm not an animal. And I'll freely admit sound bars are not immune to jargon. So if you hear a bunch of words that make no sense, you can watch my soundbar 101 video. You'll come out the other end at the very least armed to annoy your local electronics retail associate. And yes, while my sparkly background is perfect, sometimes the words that fall out of my face aren't. So look for updates and corrections in the description. You'll also find some timestamps there. Design and build. The whole look and feel and size in practical terms, let's just round up, is an exact replica of the Q950T. I was hoping for some design updates. There are some changes, but they're extremely minimal. The bar continues to have a unique shape. Six sides around the perimeter with a flat top and bottom, and a regular hexagonal prism is the best I got for you. The majority of the bar that remains visible to you from your TV watching position is covered in the same type of fabric as the Q950T. I'm thinking just tell the carpet guy to keep on trucking. I didn't see Samsung call out the fabric designer Kvadrat, but it's quite similar. It remains a proper chick magnet if fuzzies were chicks. Also, if memory serves, this cloth here is much more sticky to the bar than the T. It doesn't really move around. Completely ignoring my advice, they decided to keep the most detailed display on the top of the bar which is a pretty brilliant way to serve customers that hate themselves. The back and bottom is mostly exposed plastic. You'll find your ports and mounting holes on the bottom and your typical two-part soundbar stand is included in the box. The bar feels sturdy, but it seems quite average from a materials perspective, just plastic and fabric. The design highlights are the tapered and angled sides and the corresponding horizontal grills, pushing it into the Star Wars Battlestar Galactica universe, etc. The rear surround styling is 100% basic <laughs> I'll describe what's going on anyway. You got rounded edges and corners. The sides hiding drivers have the soundbar cloth on them. So the top front and one side. So yep, three channels on each surround speaker. We'll get there. To help the non-drivered side fit in, the other side that's made of plastic, it's given a cloth-like look and texture. So you know, the rest of it is so attractive that they just couldn't stop. The back is matte plastic with a sync button, state indicator LEDs, and a mounting hole. On the bottom, you have four little rubber feet and your power port with some cable routing goodies. Amongst soundbar kit surrounds, these are pretty beefy in terms of size, weight, and density. The style is neutral, ignorable, which is a perfectly fine style for a soundbar kit system surround, to be honest. The sub, let's just call it exactly the same as its predecessor. Gray made of MDF and a cloth circle grill on the right side. You'll find the blowhole, sync buttons, and power port on the back. The sub, it's completely average and uninspired on a design and build standpoint. It checks a box. Driver array. Well, we have a monster, an 11.1.4 channel system. I think it's the channel winner with 16 total real channels. Definitely the winner in terms of ear level channels, 11 of them, 
which I think is the primary selling point for the soundbar system. All right, so let's first zoom in on the soundbar, which is a 7.0.2 channel speaker, and from a channel count is exactly the same as the Q950T. Starting on the front, we have a left, center, and right channel. Each channel is made of three separate drivers, two woofers and a tweeter. Most soundbars do not have a dual woofer tweeter trio in all three of these channels. So good on you, Samsung. On the sides, you have two channels, a surround and wide angle channel, both acting to widen the soundstage by bouncing sound off walls at different angles. If you're privileged enough to have walls, I don't know your situation. Both of these channels are just a single woofer. The top of the bar has a left and right upward firing height channel meant to simulate ceiling speakers by bouncing sound off your ceiling. So that's right, your ceiling is given another function with the sound bar besides the mundane task of keeping you dry or whatever and keeping the skeeters out. As you may be aware, the surround speakers are home to the big channel upgrade. As with the T, you have a forward and upward firing driver, but Samsung in 2021 said, wait a second, why are we only using two sides of this thing when we could be using three? So each surround, instead of being a 1.0.1 speaker, as with the T, is a 2.0.1 speaker, each adding a side firing woofer on the side facing away from you. So more sound bouncing and less headphone. Anyway, all of this is intended to fill out the rear sound stage. We'll judge how effective this is after the sound check. The sub has the same old eight inch woofer, which is pretty average in the soundbar world. So the math to get you to 11.1.4, I'll give it to Samsung. Unlike many soundbars with inflated channel counts, all the channels are real. So high five, bro. I missed. The ports, they've remained unchanged from Mr. T. But as a reminder, if you start creeping around the under regions, you'll find your legacy optical port, which just don't, unless someone has kidnapped your family, be reasonable. Also an eARC port and two HDMI pass-throughs. Let me just talk about audio return channel for a little bit. So audio return channel or ARC is an HDMI port and is different than your optical connection, both in that it, like all HDMI ports, can receive video signals but it also enables higher audio transfer rates. Yes, your ARC port is your new and approved optical port. But within the ARC family, you have winners and those that are not winners. So you have regular ARC and enhanced audio return channel or eARC. eARC is desirable because it enables the transfer of lossless audio from your also eARC enabled TV whereas traditional ARC does not support lossless formats pumped out of your Blu-ray players and gaming consoles. I'm not here to judge you for using just ARC, but maybe take some time to consider your life choices. When a soundbar has pass-throughs, however, you're no longer subject to your TV's limitations and you can plug your Blu-ray player directly into the bar, feeding the bar the lossless audio while the video signal keeps on trucking through the HDMI cable connecting the bar and the TV. It's very convenient. So with this bar, you can get the good lossless stuff directly from the source with the pass-throughs or through your eARC enabled TV. Lots of flexibility there. If you're still skeptical of this ARC thing, optical for life, it does make it easier to control the bar volume using the TV remote as the signals are transferred through your ARC connection, not the less reliable IR receiver on your TV remote. Overall, the number of ports, pass-throughs, auxiliary, etc., is more indicative of maybe a $600 to $1,000 bar. So Samsung is skimping a little on this front. It's up to you and your specific circumstance or goal on whether this is a big deal. And as with the T, I'm still not a fan of the port placement from an aesthetics or ergonomics perspective. It's cramped and requires a lot of cable bending. The whole situation lacks dignity. Audio formats. You're good, bro. You got all your Dolby's and DTSX's, lossy and lossless. So whether DVD, Netflix, Blu-ray, you got the audio format support to play your audio as intended. And right out of the gate, you get eight channel LPCM support. So you shouldn't be subject to any of this, like with the last one, 
when using an Apple TV or gaming console, for instance. As soon as you like that fire, you're committed. He can't switch off. So enjoy your top tier convincing 3D audio, which is what this 16 channel system is really designed for. Audio adjustments. The sound controls seem to be largely the same as Mr. T. You have four sound modes. If you're looking for the truest representation of surround audio, then keep it on standard. Otherwise you have surround, game pro, and adaptive sound that will upmix all your content to 11.1.4. Game Pro creates space to really go over the top on the spatial effects. Surround and Adaptive are aimed at enhancing spatial effects, but keeping it a half step classier, more natural. On top of this, you have the choice to enable Active Voice Amplifier or AVA, a voice enhancement feature that uses mics to help isolate the voice. You'll run across Auto EQ that uses a mic in the sub to help deliver a more balanced low frequency response, new to the Q950A. This feature requires some tuning and a little funk session. Well, it's not exactly Joe Dart over there. You also have a completely separate bass boost toggle if you don't care for foreplay. And with compatible Samsung TVs, you'll find the option to turn on SpaceFit or Adaptive Sound Plus, which uses mics to give a more balanced sound to the entire system. This is also new to the Q950A. Q-Symphony, which was introduced last year and uses TV speakers to augment surround effects, can be activated via your higher end 2020 and later Samsung TVs. My Samsung TV remains at 2019, so... <clears throat> You have the same virtualization option that attempts to simulate rear speakers if none are connected, which is kind of a silly feature on this particular system. And for good measure, you have a night mode that limits the loud sounds and raises the low sounds, making it a little easier to hear the TV while not disturbing the rugrats. I'll go ahead and close on a personal highlight. You have the option to adjust channel levels and have up to a seven frequency band adjustment in the standard sound mode. Otherwise, you're just limited to treble and bass adjustments. Device to bar streaming. The Q958 kept Bluetooth and Spotify connect and added AirPlay support for higher quality and if desired, multi-room streams with other AirPlay 2 devices. This is a big ad for Apple users who are thinking of using this thing for music from time to time. Oh, I was just giving the sound bars aren't for music crowd time to yell and comment. You guys done? Anyway, sound off on how many of you Apple folks buy Samsung soundbars. Because you made me. Voice assistant support. Well, you're stuck with Alexa again, with a mic. I was not overly impressed with her last year. Alexa, play music on Spotify. Here's Spotify. Um, but let's try again. Alexa, play Spotify music. Spotify is not supported on this device. Well, communication is key. In all seriousness, it's far from perfect, but the experience does seem a bit more refined than with the Q950T. And don't forget, you can mute the mic right here. Here are some more things Alexa can do for you if you're into that kind of thing. Displays. The main one is on top of the bar. If you can't figure out why you would keep a display there, well, you don't deserve to know. So let me describe the person that would be driven crazy by this display. You wanna know the volume level number. You wanna know EQ or channel levels and confirmation of what you're changing. Sound mode confirmation, 3D audio confirmation, Yes, the ARC, a notable high-profile soundbar doesn't give you a detailed display either, but making this information available in a place you have no shot of seeing while sitting is rubbing salt on the wound. To take the edge off just a pinch, the A kept the forward three LED display that lights up when a command is received and has little tricks like providing directional information about volume and when in pairing mode. Still plenty of edge. If you pair this bar with a Samsung TV, however, you do get volume level and you can check sound mode settings. 
So there are integration benefits from a bar information standpoint. Controls, it's three-pronged, bar, remote, and app. You can't do much on the bar other than control volume, disable the mic, toggle sources, go into pairing mode. On the other hand, you can control everything with the remote, which shares the same design language as other Samsung remotes. You have a fair amount in terms of immediate access, but for the really nerdy settings, you got to go digging. The app is fine, but my big gripe is the amount of time it takes to get into the soundbar settings. Like wake up already. And I'm still quite perplexed why you can't adjust channel level on the app where it makes the most sense. Like only people who get off on self humiliation are going to walk over to the bar, hover over the little display and tirelessly toggle through channel levels on the remote. I saw someone do it once. It was hard to watch. Elliot, go increase the rear channels. Samsung is also seriously lagging on audio type confirmation other than 3D audio. They have an enormous area in the app to confirm the audio format. Stop being lame. You can update the bar right from the app, which is obviously more desirable than doing it with your stick. USB. Sound quality, I'll admit it. In terms of putting together a satisfying sound structure and spatial effects, it's the bar to beat. Per usual with Samsung flagship bars, the sound wallops. I mean, you're already heating up at 15%. So as each channel is actually a real channel, Samsung does not need to be as severe as say a Nakamichi with the EQing. The sound never felt hollow or tinny or overly processed. This bar somehow is able to maintain a satisfying audio structure with solid mid-level dynamics and deliver top-notch satisfying spatial effects. This is not normal. The side firing speakers did add an extra spatial element, or I'd say it was noticeable. You sense the rain starting at the ceiling and coming down towards you. Metal stuff whizzing right in back of your head. Not all effects are as 3D convincing as others. Sometimes you really believe the sound is right there in front of you, and sometimes you sense it's coming right from that rear speaker. All this being said, it's a top tier soundbar system for 3D audio. Unlike the T, I didn't experience crackling or cutting out from the surrounds. So that communication has improved as far as I can tell. So about the subwoofer. First, I would hope future editions would come with an expansion option. I sense Samsung is attempting to maximize the sound they can make with a four-piece set, not necessarily sell you a seven-piece set like Nakamichi, for instance. Despite this, while it's not a wow factor, it performs admirably in terms of its contribution to the sound. It wants to deliver a cooperative bass rather than a bass response that would be considered overwhelming or a show-off. 
Considering all this, I think you will find yourself hoping for a little more refinement on the attack and decay and shape of the base response. I wanna say it's an improvement over the T's base performance, but maybe I'm just in a better mood than last year. I mean, last year was pure garbage. I enjoyed playing music on the bar. It can more than easily fill up your main living space. You have options on how big you want to make the sound. So from 2.1 on standard mode to adaptive mode with bass boost, you'll notice quite the difference. A big positive here is that I didn't sense the music was completely gutted or ruined with the extra processing. As with video audio, Samsung found a way to deliver stimulating and satisfying sound at the same time. Sound-wise, in just about every dimension, it's the soundbar system to beat. It's the winner. Conclusion, I just said it. It wins on sound. I recommend this bar even with its ham-handed execution on some of the usability. Samsung has released a more finished product than last year. It's a less buggy setup, quality LPCM support right out of the gate, AirPlay 2 to make it less of a one-off system, more of a part of an ecosystem you can enrich. The side-firing rear speakers helped to expand its cinematic dominance and made it more thrilling to listen to. The app and the display placement and making adjustments on the remote remain pain points, but this year, pain points feel much more like the exception than the rule. Okay, here are the practical, living in the real world improvements Samsung should make next year, in no particular order. Put the display on the front. Provide a way to always know what audio format you're listening to. Redesign the ports to have more spacing and consider a straight back configuration. Give us an aux in option. Put channel level controls in the app. This is a complete head scratcher omission. Allow for the expansion of two subs. Make the subs something to brag about like JBLs. Don't use LG's SN11RG as your benchmark. Maybe modernize your bar buttons and support actions like track control. And add Chromecast support. Well, that's all I got. Please support the channel. Catch you on the next one. Go increase the rear channels. <laughs>